Hello, I'm Michael Parker and welcome to Antidote. Today we're discussing 1966 and the 50th anniversary of the rise of the psychedelic revolution. I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by a man who was at the center of the storm. He was a friend and confidant to LSD guru Timothy Leary and as a result of that he would spend some of his next years on the run for who he knew and what he knew. I'm very pleased to join, have back in the studio, Mr. John Shule. Pleasure. Thank you, Michael, for having me. Thank you for coming on. You were on Sean's show a couple of weeks ago and everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. So today we wanted to have you back in and dig a little deeper. So the first thing I want to do is take us back to September 19th, 1966, <laughs> the founding of the League of Spiritual Discovery. What was that? Who was part of it and what was its purpose? You know, to best answer your question, uh, Michael, let me give you a little history because the history is important. It was a result, it was a cause and effect event over a number of years. In the late and mid 40s, uh, when a chemist in Sandoz uh, discovered and created the LSD uh, molecule, uh, as soon as it became aware in the chemical and psychological area that this uh, was a tremendous psycho-accelerator drug, uh, immediately the Intelligence Department of the United States of America uh, created a program called MKUltra. Yes. And that was in the mid-50s, uh, and MKUltra's purpose was to develop and perfect the use of LSD as a weapon. Uh, to uh, disable unified battalions of military uh, personnel uh, so that you could disrupt a, uh, an army, mm -hmm. uh, possibly use it to discover the truth or implant a truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that period, uh, the government uh, privately did this and then also did it through uh, grants to programs in colleges. One of them that was selected was Harvard under the uh, direction of a doctor, uh, Henry Murray. And he was receiving funds from the CIA uh, to explore the psychological effects and thus have another uh, environment by which the CIA could uh, get information. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, uh, there was a brilliant uh, psychologist who at the Kaiser Foundation in the uh, late 50s had created a document called the Interpersonality Diagnostic Test. And that test was a revolutionary test that was adopted by the CIA, by the NSA. Um, I believe that uh, we even have a, uh, a picture of uh, the original cover of this document. And the reason I bring it up is because that document and the test from that document wound up being the uh, standard test for any governmental agency, whether it be the military, CIA, or NSA, to understand who this person was and whether we could use them for this or that or the other. Mm -hmm. And it was based upon this work uh, that was a seminal work at the time that uh, Murray uh, was suggested to go out and get this dynamic new psychologist, Timothy Leary, to come into Harvard and to start to lecture mm -hmm. on personality adjustments and personality quality. And he joined with another uh, associate professor, uh, Richard Alpert, who now, of course, uh, we know better as uh, Baba Ramdas. That's right. And the two of them were brought into Harvard in this, under this program. Um, I don't believe that, that either uh, Richard or Kim or later Ralph Metzner really understood that there was a connection at the higher level in the uh, Harvard program with the CIA, but they were independent in it. You don't think they knew? No, I don't believe. And if they did know, I don't believe that what they were doing was part of that program. They were part of the legitimate program. Sure. Now, in, in looking into it, they were given the assignment for psycho accelerators, and that got them involved with psilocybin. And then later, of course, LSD made it into it. And uh, it was at that time that I believe Harvard and the people that had originally funded Ultra MK realized that 
what Leary and Alpert were discovering was not keeping this in the box because what immediately started happening was, uh, was this group started saying, what an unbelievable uh, uh, medicine this is for uh, psychic patients and people who have uh, schizophrenia or addiction. Mm -hmm. And thus it was leaving the box of being a weapon. Right. And so actually it was uh, probably a year or two after they were at uh, Harvard that they were voted out and thrown out of Harvard. By the way, the representative that voted to throw them out on the board was Dr. Murray. Yes. And that started a series of uh, events. One, I think that what had happened is it became evident that there were controls, that there were efforts to control these psycho accelerators and that the control at that time in the uh, 50s to 60s was a control that was coming out of a weaponization of them. Mm -hmm. And so when Tim and Richard left, they continued to explore the use of this molecule that they realized was even more, uh, use, could be used for spiritual exploration of the individual. Mm -hmm. And they went off to Mexico, and that's when they started to look toward ancient texts or other people to help guide this psychoactive experience. And the first document that came out uh, of that was a thing called the Psychedelic Experience. And that book was based upon the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Yes. And it was, uh, it was the first book that helped you formulate a understanding of what accelerated connectivity of the neurons in the brain uh, are and how to guide you much like a ski poles down a ski sure. run of how to help you guide yourself through this experience. Um, after Mexico, uh, they were uh, invited to a place in Millbrook uh, County, which was upstate New York by the Hitchcock Mellon family. Yes. Uh, the Mellon family, of course, of the banking and the Hitchcocks of Polo and, and, and uh, also finance. And the, uh, they were given access to a 64-room house on a 2,000-acre uh, uh, property in which the Castilla Foundation, and by the way, Castilla came from a Herman Hess book. Yes. Of, uh, uh, and that was something that continued throughout the entire uh, Millbrook experience is uh, Herman Hess, Aldous Huxley, and using symbols from what they observed as guidances. And then it was at this uh, property in Millbrook that it really started to take even more of a individual's exploration of spirituality. And the second uh, seminal book was uh, The Psychedelic Prayers. The Psychedelic Prayers were based upon the Tao Te Ching, but what was uh, more important in the psychedelic prayers was the words became more like kohans, more like uh, uh, poetry, and thus were able to be recited during the experience. So they became the first book of a direct guide into the psychedelic experience and helping you uh, adjust and deal with whatever this phasmagorical uh, event that was being uh, uh, unveiled to you uh, in your now experience. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, it also became more and more evident that there was more pressure on the period, not only for self-exploration, but also for political exploration, that the government was beginning to say, we'll tell you what we believe you should know and the amount of information that you should know. And by the way, don't question us. Right. That, coupled with an obvious move on the freedom of an individual's right to explore their soul, the sovereignty of the individual's soul became more and more evident that there was a clamp down on this, and the government was going to make things illegal. No free and thinkers the, here. Yeah, uh, the, you know, too too dangerous. In the name of freedom, uh, we're going to protect you from these terroristic acts that could create chaos within your free nature. So, 
jump on the horse with us and help us limit your personal uh, uh, liberties in the name of what we believe is the good of all. And the individual's right to explore within their own being, their consciousness became a real focal issue and that's where it really became evident that in relationship to the United States of America, our wonderful country, that it was under religion, freedom of religion, that this right for individuality. Now, it wasn't the religion of patriarchal or Christianity, but it was the religion of the individual's right to explore their soul. Yes. So the League of Spiritual Discovery, it was largely headquartered at the Millbrook home, I guess, initially. And were you, did you live there or visit there several times? Yes, I had, uh, I had a period of time that I did. Yeah. Uh, I was going to NYU at the time, doing B-ins, uh, started the first New York City B-in. And then at a uh, wonderful party, uh, met uh, two magnificent uh, uh, people at that time, and that was Rosemary Woodruff. Uh, yes. and Timothy Leary. And it was at that party that I became uh, closer to uh, both of them independently, not even knowing that uh, they, they were, were a couple. couple, but they were fighting that night, so they weren't going home together. So Rosemary went home with Richard Alpert and Tim came home with me, and that began a long-term relationship with uh, both of them over the years that wound up going to Melbrook. And Melbrook was the experimental laboratory for uh, guiding. Yes. What do you do on these experiences? A candle, the environment, what to say. Set. And that's where the League for Spiritual Discovery came out of, was the desire to create a religious organization. And we got a religious organization certified uh, by the IRS, and it was one of the first independent religions founded. Well, let's, let's step back a little bit because, okay, so the League gets founded September 19th, 1966. A month later, LSD is illegal across the U.S. Two years later, it's a Schedule I drug. Yet people like yourself, Leary, uh, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love out here on the West Coast, you guys didn't shy away from it. I mean, Leary was going around to college campuses uh, promoting it. The Brotherhood was making their own brand, the Orange Sunshine. So why would you guys take the stand that you did was something that was clearly illegal. Well, understand the period too. There were two specific things happening at the time that created uh, a tribal effect again uh, with the the youth. Mm -hmm. One was this right to explore your own soul individually as long as you didn't go out and hurt other people. And the other was the realization that there was specific manipulation of information given to us from our government. Mm -hmm. So we had these two tracks going on. One was a spiritual track and one was a political track. And it was very difficult to separate yourself from that time because if you were a spiritual person trying to um, uh, promote the freedom you were also within that area of the group that was trying to stop the war in Vietnam. It was all part of the same kind yes. of control. That makes sense. Um, this picture that we're looking at here, this is a BN, I believe, 1967 Central Park? The first uh, New York BN. We put it together after. And this is, this is John, by the way, um, the tall gentleman with the flower in his hair. Who else do we, are we looking at in this photo? Uh, we're looking at, uh, actually, in the front row, there's uh, four members of the League, the original League. And uh, it was just, I didn't even know this picture was taken until 1997 on an airplane to Europe, and I picked up a Time magazine, and this picture was in it. And this originally ran in Rolling Stone, I believe. This picture? I don't, I don't believe this picture ran anywhere but, until this time. But we took it out of some article. No, um, it was a Time magazine article from 1996. Oh, okay. I, wow, okay. And uh, so we decided to put together a bee-in. We had heard in San Francisco that they did this thing being in love, so we decided to make up posters and do it at the um, at the uh, Sheep's Meadow in Central Park. Expected maybe 10,000 people to show up, and by 11 o'clock, over 100,000 people had showed up. And the police and the fire department were all there, but they were totally confused because 
We weren't protesting anything. Everybody was flying kites. Kids were dancing. Flowers were being thrown. Fun is always something to be scared of. <laughs> Wait a minute. They're not riding here. They're not uh, burning anything. They're having fun. Well, let's talk about Timothy Leary a little bit because there is so much mythology about the man. There, I, I mean, you've corrected me in some of our prior discussions. There have been books that have come out in the last 10 or 15 years where they talk about Leary, they talk about the brotherhood of eternal love, and certainly there's always the rumor, you know, you talk about Timothy Leary, people say, oh, you know, he was CIA. What was the truth about Tim Leary the man? The program at Harvard at the highest level through Murray was in fact financed by the CIA. But Tim Leary and Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzner's areas were not at all involved in that. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons they got thrown out was when their interpersonal personality diagnostic part of their lecture series turned into investigating the uses of psilocybin for the personality. They immediately discovered that this three group were saying that the psychoactives were good for medical treatment and purposes, and that brought the use of the drug out of the box of a weapon. Understood. So they were fired. And I'm sure that they were aware at some point that there was some governmental movement behind that, but... But they were already on their mission at that point. Yeah, they, they were already out of the box. Yeah. And no, I don't believe that at any time, at least... Uh, up until pressures many years later on Tim being arrested and thrown back in prison, that Tim was working for the U.S. government at all. If anything, Tim, Richard, and Ralph were working for us. I understand. Well, let's stick with this because Tim Leary had numerous altercations with the law. And beginning of 1970, he was looking at a long stint in jail. So those of you, he and some of you around him conceived the possibility of getting him out of jail. Tell us about that time. Well, Tim was arrested because his daughter had less than yes. a, a quarter of an ounce of grass. And that was on the border uh, of Texas, I yes. believe. And it became real mm -hmm. evident that when Tim and his daughter and Rosemary were arrested, that they gave bail to both his daughter and Rosemary later dropping the charges, but Tim was kept in prison. So as a result of that, uh, we realized that we had a situation of Tim being in prison, facing a trial, uh, being charged with these again, real small issues, but that his punishment and the focus on it was more be to shut him up politically. Well, he was high profile. Very high pro And the other thing was that, by the way, a lot of us, that we didn't agree with, was his running for governor. That changed a lot of things. Uh, it changed the kind of police that were following everybody at that time. Which you were an local. avid self-promoter at that point. What I mean uh, is like what, what, what you're saying that you guys didn't really agree with him running for president. And I'm uh, saying governor. Go, I'm sorry for governor. Yes, he was he was stoking the machine a little bit well, by doing that. He was that. doing what he felt was necessary. So, for instance, one of his platforms that really scared the uh, old man Brown, Brown Sr., not Jr., was uh, the fact that he wanted to license marijuana. And the license was a thousand dollars for the year. And the figures that came out of California was they could turn around the entire California debt in one issuance of licenses. Well, that was revolutionary, not only in a solution to economic problem, but also against that thing called the war on drugs. Yes. And the war on drugs was and continues to be a, an executive branch political decision to control protesting. Well, let me interject because that brings up the story that hit the news last week in which John Ehrlichman had supposedly given this quote to um, a writer that the true purpose for the war on drugs was this suppression 
of the black community and the anti-war community. Um, AKA that, hippies. Yeah, AKA hippies. Now the veracity of that is being argued. Some around him are saying it's, it's not legitimate, but regardless, that's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. And, and um, that's what it is. It was then and it is now. Boom. And those are the things that we have to be aware of. Right. Um, at that time, uh, we put together a defense fund holding together. Uh, Rosemary uh, was given the ability on her bail to go to certain places that we felt were necessary to raise money and attention because uh, they were, uh, he was a high profile political prisoner. And the people that began sponsoring this and falling behind it were incredible. I mean, the, the, the most uh, public were people like uh, James Colburn and uh, Yoko and John uh, Lennon. But it went down to intelligentsia. Uh, you know, Aldous Huxley in, in his last days had said that this was going to become a political issue, the freedom of the individual's right to explore the universe. Um, and Elridge Cleaver, Bobby Seale, Angela Davis, this whole group was being suppressed and thrown into jail. And by the way, if they could get you on drugs, that is the way to do it because then it wasn't political, you were criminal. Sure. And that's what yeah. Richard Nixon did consciously during his particular period. So I am not at all surprised, it took this long for it to come out, I'm surprised, that this was a directed, willed act by the government to promote um, freedom to their people under fear. Right. Well, well, let's talk about getting Leary out of jail because, listen, you were in contact with a lot of hip people. I mean, you knew a lot of political activists. You and Rosemary and your group knew the potential for this possibly going south, but you did it anyway. Uh, tell me about it. Well, Tim wanted it. Yeah. And Tim, right away, he felt that this was it, that the government was going to cement him in the wall. And by all indications, they were. So what started to arise is the defense fund became a tool for us to explore what were the elements that we needed to get him out. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because the people that came and volunteered their services was a wide range of people, but they all shared one thing, that there was an issue here of a political executive branch controlling their citizens for their will. And of course it was not something that was secret because what happened with the Vietnam War? It was a, a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. to direct it. So a, a very amorphous group of people started coming together. And um, the break was, uh, was planned. Uh, did we know the repercussions? How could you not? Right. How could you not? Yep. Um, the participants, I mean, there was a, a, a straw polling for who were the ones that were going to pick him up as soon as he got out of jail. And of course, Jennifer Dorn, Bernadette Dorn, and uh, Mark Rudd drove the hippie bus from St. Louis Bispo to the next stop. And, and just so our audience knows, now the way that he got out, he like yeah. shimmied across a, yeah. a what, power line? Yes, we, we couldn't break him out of the jail. Right. He had to get out. Right. Now, fortunately, because of the interpersonality diagnostic test, which was still being given to everybody, when Tim got the test, they didn't even know that he wrote it. Right. So he answered the questions, and the result was, oh, well, this guy isn't a threat for escape or anything, and they put him in a minimum security prison at St. Louis Obispo. And Tim discovered a high-tension wire that, in fact, went from a part of the prison outside the walls of the, of the, of the gate. And that night, he had worked out enough that hand over hand, he broke himself out of jail. Wow. From that moment on, it was a 
massive group of people from all sorts of different directions of lives, from Charles de Gaulle's inner circle to the most liberal law firm in the United States of America, to radical lawyers, uh, to the Weather Underground, to the Brotherhood, who all uh, pitched in and did their part in making sure that once he got out of prison that he could keep getting out. Mm -hmm. And he went overseas to Algeria? Well, the, that was the first uh, uh, escape plan that was part of this particular time was Elridge Cleaver. And because of the connections of getting out of the United States, it wound up that he was given not only asylum in, in Algeria, but because of the connections to Algeria, he was given an embassy as uh, the Black Panthers. So mm -hmm. they had an embassy there. And that became the, the path by which Tim and Rosemary uh, were funneled into Algeria. Uh, as good as that was, it became a disaster because yes. he had to be broken out a second time from Algeria, not from the government, but from Elridge Cleaver. Right. And so at that point, he goes to Switzerland? Well, the, the, the plan of the breakout was one of our dear friends, uh, uh, I believe, Simon Vinkanov. He was one of the heads of the White Party of, of Holland that created... Uh, the white bicycle, being able to smoke marijuana in, in coffee shops. This isn't an Orion kind of thing. This is something else entirely. Yeah, but he was one of the sponsors of a big uh, conference on psychology. Mm -hmm. And Tim was invited as a keynote speaker. That was a strategy. That was the cover. That was the cover to get him out. That yeah. Elridge couldn't deny it because sure. it was a public event. Yeah. Uh, but his path to there never had him arrive in the Netherlands, by the way, where the U.S. government was waiting to rearrest him. It wound up in Switzerland. So yes, wound up in Switzerland, and it was in 1970 that after all this period of time that I, was, uh, that I reunited with both he and Rosemary in a uh, ski resort called Valaris, where he, he had a, uh, they both had a house. Mm -hmm. All right, so, and then at some point, he gets extradited back to the U.S.? Well, Michael, that happened a little bit later. The sequence of events was uh, with Tim and, and Rosemary in Switzerland, there was applications for asylum for both Tim and Rosemary. But it became evident on my arrival that the tensions between Tim and Rosemary uh, had been going on for a while, and it was time to separate. Mm -hmm. And Rosemary and I had been close, as close as I had been to anyone since 1967. So the two of us uh, departed Valaris and uh, started in Switzerland uh, separately. It wasn't until a number of year, a year or so later that two things happened. One was we started to discover that for some reason Rosemary's name was taken off of the asylum paper application in Switzerland which Ooh. we thought was strange, Yes. which isolated us further yes. and made us a little anxious because now there was no place for her to secure. Because not only did she jump bail on the same charge as Tim had, but now she was an accessory to a jailbreak and international fleeing. So the charges were being piled up on top of each other. Yes. Uh, so we started to disappear into Switzerland and, and a few other places and redirecting ourselves to explore the esoteric, to start the journey once again. So this, this is the point in which you and Rosemary left, made, yeah. the, made the break, yeah. we're out of here, Tim, you're on your own, figure it out. Because, now did he... Well, was I, he, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, Tim, you're on your own, figure but, it out. But, that's, but, <laughs> but that's not which, how we felt. I was, understand, was, we all love each other. I understand that. I would, but let me ask you this: You're saying that her name was taken off the asylum papers. That that sounds a little sketchy to me. No, not sketchy. It was it was the act of a will, and and it sent us a message, and we knew something was up. And then later, Tim gets up and leaves and goes to Afghanistan, which is the last place he should have gone to, because it was under the rule of America, um, and. Uh, he was arrested and brought back to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, it was at that time, finding himself back in the United States arrested, that after a relatively short period of time, uh, we received a letter uh, through the channels from Tim in St. Louis Obispo, uh, basically informing us 
that here is the plan of how it's going forward from this moment on. And you and Rosemary, uh, here's the card of a regional FBI agent. Go ahead and talk to them because it's all arranged and you'll not go to jail and everything will be fine. And that was the tipping block for yes. us because there were 50 or so people that we all loved, people from a, a Supreme Court trial lawyer to the head of a major nursing uh, a group at a major uh, hospital organization, besides the lawyers, the weathermen, the brotherhood, that were all being turned over uh, uh, as a uh, chit for Tim being released. Mm -hmm. uh, one might not think that was significant until you realize that Richard Nixon got the transcript from Tim, and within it, it satisfied all the paranoia that Richard Nixon had sure. that the liberal lawyers, uh, the radical uh, uh, leftists, uh, the drug dealers, uh, all of these people and socialists and communists were all conspiring Against to overthrow him. America. And as a result, John Mitchell was given the uh, job to bring this to trial. Uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, if the only witness on the trial uh, uh, was Timothy Leary, you can be sure the defense would have said, well, Dr. Leary, how many times have you taken LSD? And with no corroboration, there was no case. Right. So Rosemary and I realized that we had to go on the run for the statute of limitations, which we did for the next almost 10 years in 12 countries. 10 years on the run, you and Rosemary, your family doesn't know where you're at, no one knows where you're at. I, that's astounding. Yeah, it, uh, when you're living it, you just live it. You're in that tunnel and you just move forward. Uh, in retrospect, it was a, uh, a very difficult time. Well let's, well, let's talk about now. I mean, here we are 20, 30 years on, We've got this 50th anniversary of 66 and the revolution, the psychedelic revolution. The war on drugs still exists. But why are you speaking out now? Is there a message here that you need to deliver or? Oh, I, I won't be as bold to say a message, but I've recognized that this is a period of time in which a lot of the same things that were going on in the 60s are happening again. And that a lot of people don't look back in the history to get guidance as to what do we do in these periods of time. And for instance, the words, the war on, there's no more wars. The words, the war on is now a mechanism by which our executive branch herds people together under fear. And the continuing war on drugs is continuing. Yes, the states are doing this and that, but the federal government has a long way to go before they can declassify marijuana as a one narcotic, forget LSD, just marijuana, an herb, a sacred herb of, by the way, the tribe that the Americans got rid of called the American Indians. Um, that that has been so implemented into the fabric of law worldwide through the UN that the states can say it's legal, but the federal government's got a big problem to declassify it and take it off of all these treaties that these treaties were made to promote, quote, the war on. Understood. The war on drugs, the war on um, uh, vaccination, uh, the war on terrorism. Uh, it's a manipulative word set that gets people uh, gathered together and most of us of those 60s, we have veiled the light for the last 20, 30 years. And it's only been recently that there's been a desire of people to understand that period so they can understand more the present. And uh, a number of films, documentaries are coming out now that never would have come out, such as uh, Orange Sunshine, The yes. History of the Brotherhood, but not some book written by a, a third Nick party Shearer. with all sorts of... Mythologies yeah. and... Uh, was actually done by the founders of the Brotherhood. So Orange Sunshine was just released uh, at South by Southwest. 
The head of South by Southwest said it was the first time in the history of their festival that they had to consistently turn hundreds of people away from the premiere, the three premieres of Orange Sunshine. And just in case we didn't go over this enough, the, the, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love was a group here on the West Coast, mid 60s to early 70s kind of surfers and jocks that became enlightened and well and they, they, they started they, getting high yeah they embraced him well because they read the psychedelic prayers yeah. and that guided them to their own miraculous internal self-realization period yeah. and uh they were active enough to understand that we were all being cut off from quality psychoactives and when you're throwing your neuron system up against the universe with a creative molecule. The most important thing is the source and the purity. And it was that that an article in High Times uh, years ago came out called Deal for Real. And in Deal for yeah. Real, Tim was laying down the guidelines for the brotherhood of what the responsibility is to be able to distribute the sacrament or molecules of high quality for self-realization despite the total control of the governments. Yes. And, and that's what they did. So right now, I mean, within the U.S., you mentioned, you know, the states' rights versus the, the, the federal outlook on marijuana. I mean, in 2015, I believe legal pot, was there was like five, five and a half billion dollars in business. And yet, the war on drugs continues. And in a way, this is perhaps the intrinsic question here, which is, is this really just a conditioning of citizens and cutting us off from a right to explore our consciousness? Or, or what, what, what's the struggle here? The struggle is the creation of a policing agency totally under the executive branch. J. Edgar Hoover, could say a lot about him, but he fought the creation of the DEA. He already felt that the FBI had jurisdiction over that. But the Nixon administration created the DEA specifically for their war on drugs. It was part of their tactics. But because it was an executive branch entity, there were no funds through Congress given to it. Mm -hmm. So they came up with this plan that when the federal government or the DEA who were, quote, the federal government, but were really an executive branch policing agency, when they were involved with a bust and they included county or state police, that all of the confiscated goods or properties from it would be auctioned off and divided among those policing agencies. Uh, now in the Creating circle, revenue. Creating revenue, which now is billions of dollars. Yeah. So when you say that the market for marijuana is billions of dollars, it still pales to the funds and the necessity for local state policing organizations to get these funds from this war on drugs. Because there's no replacement for the funds. That is going to be one of the issues that have to be overcome too before the federal government then relaxes marijuana. And this kind of history and awareness is really why all of us are coming out and talking now, is to impart upon those that have come later, my brothers and sisters of youth, that it's important to one, explore your inner self, self-realization, dissolve, coagulate, perfect that foundation in which you're on, and the responsibility you have to not necessarily accepting that what you're being told is the truth, and to begin to creatively put together your own map for what is necessary and what there is to be done. John, this has been a stimulating conversation with a lot to think about. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm glad you're speaking up. It's, it's an interesting message. It's a vital message to not only the millennials, but to all of us. And we didn't even get into the part about what the media has to do with all of this, which is also an integral part. But 
Thank you so much for coming on Antidote. I really appreciate this. Michael, a pleasure. Thank you, and thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this has been a mind blower. I mean, we've done a lot of stuff on the 60s, but the deal is it's important. I mean, there are things to be taken away from the 60s. And when people use the cliche that somehow the 60s were lost or that, you know, that people just turn into yuppies, I, I don't really see it that way. I just see it as a culmination of constant change and certain things really good came out of the 60s. The war on drugs and this recent quote um, from Ehrlichman, who knows if it's real, I certainly think the actions reflect that it was real and it's something that we will have to continue to continue with, uh, contend with. Our sovereignty of our personal consciousness and the intrinsic freedom that is implied by that, if your mind is not free, what is free? My name is Michael Parker. This has been Antidote. Until next week, you, me, every single one of us, we are the Antidote.